happy Easter once again. He is risen. He's risen indeed. My wife and I both grew up in Prineville, and after college, we got married. And then pretty quickly after that, less than six months later, we moved away. We left Prineville as quickly as possible, and we were gone for about 10 years. So 10 years later, when we moved back, it was just the two of us when we left, and we moved back. We had three kids at the time. One of them, baby Hallie, was still in the car seat, just in diapers still. And when we came back, I took a job teaching high school at a, at a boarding school. And when I got to that school, I quickly made friends with my colleagues. And that was one of the most rewarding parts of that job was the people that I worked with. And one of these um, men became a really close friend pretty quickly. We, get, we got to know each other really well. He was a, he was a follower of Jesus. He was a Christian. And, and we kind of hit it off. And as we got to know each other, I, I found out something really interesting about my friend. His name is Paul. I found out that he had a friend who I knew of because this friend was a New York Times best-selling author. He was a Christian author, had written a book a few years before this that had hit the, hit the New York Times bestseller list, and I had read the book and really liked it. And um, So that was a really cool thing. And he, he told me about his relationship with this friend, that they had gotten to know each other when my friend Paul was driving his old Volkswagen bus around the United States in his early 20s, and he picked this friend up in Texas somewhere and took him the rest of the way with him. And as, we're, as he's telling me the story and we're talking about it, um, I realized that the first book that this gentleman, his friend, had written was actually a memoir about that trip. And it was re-released after his other book became so popular. And I'm looking at my friend Paul going, you were the main character in this guy's book. Like, or the second character, you know, like they were one of the two main characters in this guy's book. That's, that was mind-boggling to me that he would be a character in a popular, well-known, best-selling book. And not many of us can, can claim to be a main character in any book, right? In fact, I think if the book was written by me, it would be like on the New York Times least selling list, like the most <laughs> uninteresting books in the world list kind of thing. But can I tell you a secret this morning? Perhaps we could consider it the secret of Easter, that there is a man, even a a man who could be your friend or who is your friend, who is the center of every story. He's the center of the greatest story, and if we're willing to see it, he's actually right in the middle of every one of our stories as well. His name is Jesus. And as we'll see today, he claims to be the center and the goal and the fulfillment of every word in the Bible. The best-selling book of all time, by the way. He says he's the middle of it. Jesus Jesus made the shocking claim that everything in the Old Testament, which was the, the Hebrew Bible, the Bible that these people had in his day, that everything in the Old Testament scriptures pointed to him. Everything anticipated him. And ultimately, everything in the Old Testament was fulfilled in him. So, so Matt and Jonas, these guys, gave us a, a picture of, of Luke 24, the story that's in Luke 24, these two disciples. And one of the things that Jesus says to them as he begins to walk with them on their journey is that he interpreted, what, what Luke tells us is that he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, many of us approach Easter with kind of a skeptic's eye, right? And if you're like me, you're kind of a skeptic, right? We struggle to believe. And, and honestly, if that describes you, if you call yourself a skeptic or someone who has a hard time believing, would you, would you just understand right now that you're not alone? I mean, in fact, look around you at the people sitting around you. Just do it. Just look around for a minute. Okay, welcome your, your fellow doubters, your fellow people who are who find it difficult to believe, who, who we all struggle to believe. You're in good company. And in fact, in the story, even Jesus' closest friends, those who had walked with him for years, those who had spent time with and lived with him, those who had shared food with him, who had slept on the ground with him, who had learned from him, those who had who'd witnessed some of his miracles, him raising people from the dead and feeding 5,000 people with just a couple of loaves and some fish, of, of healing lepers and casting out demons, These people, when they first heard about the empty grave, 
What did they do? They didn't believe. Verse 11 of Luke chapter 24 says, These words seem to them like an idle tale, like an old wives' tale, like a myth, like something made up, a fable. These words seemed to them like an idle tale, and they did not believe them. And these were Jesus' best friends. So you're not alone if you're skeptical or if you doubt. And I think that these people failed to believe. I think the disciples failed to believe, just, just like you may be doing this morning, because they didn't really understand their own story. And if we're honest, most of us don't really know how to make heads or tails of our own stories. And here's where the trouble is. I think the main trouble is that, first of all, we think we are the main characters in our own stories. And that's where the the trouble comes, but, but we're not the main characters. The sooner we realize that, the sooner we realize that Jesus is not only the main character of the Bible, but of each of our stories too, the more our stories will actually begin to make sense to us. And Jesus wants to make sense of our stories. He wants us to know what our life is all about, and that's really what Luke 24 is all about. And if you want to follow along with me, you're more than welcome to in the, in the Bible, Luke chapter 24. And, and shortly after we read in Luke 24 about the empty tomb, we meet these two disciples who've left Jerusalem, and they're making a seven-mile journey. So um, thank you guys for look at, making that look a lot longer, Matt and Jonas. <laughs> but it made sense. It's heavy. They're carrying a heavy burden with them. A seven-mile walk to Emmaus by foot. They didn't have a bus or bicycle or car or anything, to this village called Emmaus in verses 13 and 14. And as they walk and talk, the newly resurrected Jesus approaches and joins them. But the, the verses 15 and 16 tell us that they didn't recognize him. And, and friendly and curious, Jesus asks them what they're discussing, what they're talking about. And in response, now get this, listen to the story here. In response, when he asks them what they're talking about, they perfectly outline the gospel story for Jesus. They tell him the right story. They speak of who Jesus is in verse 19. They say, he was, he was a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. True. They speak of his suffering and death in verse 20, about how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. And they continue on, speaking of their own hopes and their expectations for Jesus in verse 21. They said, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Their, their hope had been building and waning now over these three days. And finally, they actually referenced the empty tomb. They referenced the resurrection in verse 22. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They say they were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of us, some of those who were with us went to the tomb. They found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So I love the, how the disciples tell this story, how these two men tell the story, because they get all the words right. They get all the facts in order, but they fail to connect the dots. They're telling the story, even, even telling their own story, but they're not quite getting it right. You probably have a friend like this at work or maybe an uncle that you get together with at Thanksgiving who's always trying to tell stories, but they can't get the facts straight. Or they're always trying to tell a joke and they put the punchline in the wrong spot. Oh, hold on, hold on, let me try that again, you know. That's kind of what they're doing here. Or, or it's almost like they have a 5,000-piece jigsaw puzzle that they're trying to put together, but they lost the picture. They lost the box cover that tells them what it actually looks like. How, how easy would that be to do? Or they've gone to Ikea, and they've got a piece of furniture, and they're trying to put it together <laughs> without the instructions. Half the men in the room. And here's what Jesus says about all that, about how they tell the story. Verse 25, he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So, so the question is, when I read that, the question is why? Why are they so slow of heart to believe? 
which honestly is the appropriate question for each of us this morning, isn't it? Why am I so slow of heart to believe? Why am I so skeptical? And I think the answer Jesus gives is because they, and maybe we, have failed to truly understand our story. We've failed to truly understand the story. We're missing a key piece. They were missing the the unifying theme, the organizing principle that would help to make the whole thing make sense. So, So Jesus now gets the chance to give them exactly what they're missing, to tell them their story in light of his story. You, you see, it matters who tells a story. There's good t- storytellers, or bad, there's bad storytellers. And Jesus is the author of this story, and now he gets to tell the story. And as he tells it, he gives them the key. He gives them exactly what they need to unlock it and understand it. He gives them the unifying theme that makes sense of the whole. And when Jesus explains the gospel, and And the gospel is simply a word that means good news. When he explains the gospel, he goes back to the very beginning. It says in verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus goes back to the very beginning. The very beginning of the Bible walks them through their own story, walks them through the story of Israel, and he makes the grandiose claim that scripture has been about him all along. Wouldn't wouldn't it have been amazing? This is one of those points in history that I would want to go back to. You ever thought about that? If I go back anywhere in, in history or meet someone, where I'd go, I think I'd want to go to this Emmaus Road and walk with these guys as Jesus told the story. Of course, I'd probably have to learn how to speak Aramaic too, but it would be amazing. And we're not absolutely sure exactly what Jesus said, but we can take some educated guesses. Maybe, maybe he'd said something like this, and we'll go to the first the couple slides from here, I think. The next slide. Yeah. Maybe he went, friends, don't, don't you remember the story? Don't, don't you remember, guys, don't you remember how Adam and Eve sinned and plunged the entire human race into sin and death? But, but God, but God refused to leave them there. He, he told them, he made a promise to Adam and Eve, even as he cast them out of the garden, he said, one day there's going to be a serpent crusher. One day there's going to be a descendant of yours who will put an end to evil and sin and death that you have brought into the world. And then God slaughters an animal. And he takes the hide, the skin of that animal, and he, and he covered Adam and Eve with it in their nakedness. And his grace is shown, pointing forward to the work that Messiah would one day do to cover your sins. Guys, don't you see this? Don't you remember God's promise to our father Abraham? The the, the promise to not only bless him, but also to bless the entire world through a promised descendant. Next slide. Or how he took his son Isaac. You remember how Abraham, Abraham took Isaac, his only son, who was born to him in his old age, and he went at the behest of God and offered him up as a sacrifice. His only beloved son. But do you remember what happened, guys? Do you remember that God at the very last moment provided a replacement to be sacrificed in Isaac's place? And God gave Abraham, his son, back to him, almost if back from the dead. Do you remember this? Can can you consider this to be a picture of what the Messiah would be, a father offering up his beloved son to be a replacement for you? Guys, do you remember? Do you remember the great prophet Moses? How God used him to rescue his people as a redeemer from Egypt. And then how on that night, after he'd sent nine plagues, he sent a tenth plague. But he told the Israelites, get a perfect, a spotless lamb and sacrifice it and and eat it together. But take the blood of that lamb and put it on the doorposts of your house. And when the angel of death comes to take the firstborn son of the Egyptians, he will pass over your home. Don't you see how that points forward to the blood of the Messiah being poured out for you so that it could cover you and rescue you from death too? Guys, do you remember the story? As the Israelites were going through the wilderness and there were snakes among them. 
God sent snakes to punish them, and, and yet he also provided an antidote. He provided a way of rescue, and he had Moses make a bronze serpent and lift it up on a rod. And if any of the people had been bitten by a snake, any of your ancestors, don't you remember how they would look in faith at the bronze serpent lifted up and be healed? And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Hey guys, consider, if you will, the priests, the tabernacle, the sacrifices. Don't you remember how the priests, even to this day, constantly offer up sacrifices to to pay for and purchase forgiveness and atonement for Israel? Doesn't it seem right that the Messiah himself would both be a priest A great high priest going to the Father for you, making intercession for you, representing you to God. But he would also be a perfect sacrifice to purchase forgiveness for you. For indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Don't you see that the Messiah had to die? Of course, you remember your ancestor David. The Messiah must be a descendant of David, who is the great shepherd king, the slayer of giants, and a man after God's own heart. Wasn't the Messiah supposed to come and be an even greater king, an even greater giant slayer? And wasn't this Jesus that you're talking about, wasn't he a descendant of David? Wasn't he born in the city of David, Bethlehem, to a virgin, just like the scriptures said he would be? Remember your story, friends. Remember that the promised suffering servant of Isaiah. He was prophesied to suffer for us, to carry our griefs, our sorrows, our sins, our transgressions. He would take on all of our iniquities and pay for our sins. He was the spotless and perfect, just like a Passover lamb, sacrifice, and yet suffered unjustly, but still according to God's plan. And don't you remember... Don't you remember that God's Messiah, the suffering servant, would gain a reward even after he'd died? Brothers, the the Messiah wasn't going to stay dead. The Messiah was going to come back. He was going to be resurrected. Don't you remember? Don't you see? Now, we can't know exactly what Jesus said, but imagine it was something like that. These are some educated guesses. And what... What we do know for certain is that the gospel according to Jesus hinges on the fact that the entire Old Testament points to him, anticipates him, and is fulfilled in him. So what Jesus is doing here is he's just telling them their own story. He just happens to be reorienting their story around himself. The key to the whole story. All these disciples could see in the moment was their loss. But Jesus was showing them, your loss isn't the last word. They had lost hope. They had disbelieved. But Jesus reframes their hope for them. And he reframed their hope by reframing their story. So for these disciples, their Emmaus Road experience helps them to put the puzzle pieces in the right places. To understand. And Jesus tells them, remember your story and asks them, don't you see what it's all been leading to? Everything that has not made sense only makes sense in sight, in light of the risen Christ. Now to me, one of the most profound things about this story is that I could imagine that the risen, resurrected Jesus Christ had a few places to be on Easter Sunday morning during that day. But of all the places he could have been on that first Easter Sunday, he chooses to go, chooses to go for a walk with these two virtually unknown disciples. We only find out one of their names, Cleopas, and we don't really hear from him after this at all. And in the same way, the resurrected Christ chooses to walk with every one of you. You're not some rando, some random person to Jesus. You're important enough for him to make time to walk with you, 
and time to make himself known to you. Whether you know it or not, whether you recognize it or not, in his kindness, Jesus walks an Emmaus road with each of us. And, and, and you probably had those seasons in your life when you can look back and go, that didn't make sense at all. A season in your life when nothing makes sense. You, you look back, you can't see anything good. You can't see anything beneficial from a certain season of your life. Maybe you've experienced extreme loss. You've been wounded, you've been broken, you've been scarred, you've been through trauma, maybe just serious frustration, and it's, it's done nothing but left you bewildered. When you look at where your life's been, it's just a big question mark. And Jesus is saying to you today, do you remember your story? Remember those hard times, the, the suffering, the trauma? Remember the brokenness and the loss? And you're saying, well, yeah, duh, I remember it. He says, don't you see that I was there walking with you? I was piecing it all together, even when nothing made sense to you. Do you, do you see, if you look back, can you see where I've been with you? That, that time you were at the, the bottom of the barrel and you had no hope left? I was there. I was the one wiping your tears, even mourning alongside you. When, when you were abused or deceived or abandoned, I was there, didn't you see me? Didn't you know I was there suffering with you? When you lost everything, I can and will use even that for your good. You see, it's, it's only when we're willing and able to see our stories in the light of the resurrected Jesus, knowing he was walking with us the whole way, and he was actually the one writing our stories. It's only when we see everything in light of the resurrected Jesus that our lives make any sense. His active, his kind, loving, patient plans are woven throughout the tapestry of our lives. He's the one who holds all things together. Whether you see it or not, he is busy making something that looks broken into something beautiful. But it's only beautiful because he's the one holding it together as he walks with you, as he journeys with you on your Emmaus road. So can I encourage you today to pay attention, to remember your story, and you'll see him. I promise you'll see him. The second thing I'd say before we close this morning is, where is your road leading? The trio that was walking this road to Emmaus eventually arrived at their destination. And the two disciples, Cleopas and his friend, invited Jesus to stay with them. And it was there in that house over a meal as Jesus was breaking bread and giving thanks that their eyes were open and they were able to recognize it as Jesus, who, who he was, that the one who had been walking with them, the one who had been explaining their story, the whole scriptures to them, was Jesus himself. And that their destination ends up being very different than the one they'd anticipated. What began with hopelessness ended in hope. And what began, what started in confusion, ended in clarity. And here's what it says in verse 32. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? See, we all have an Emmaus road, and we all have an Emmaus as well, a place where we are heading in life. Most of us have goals and dreams. Some of us may be too old to have any more goals and dreams. And that's okay. Most of us, though, in our lives have had goals and dreams. We're trying to make something of our lives. And sometimes, honestly, the lives that we construct for ourselves are carefully built to insulate us from the resurrected Jesus, from the story, from the scriptures. We, we insulate and construct ourselves lives where Jesus is hidden from us and we purposely shut our eyes to recognizing him. But don't you see where your story has truly been leading? Just like the story of the Bible, it is leading to Jesus. You can recognize that or you can, you, you can refuse to, but just like these disciples on the road, your story has been leading to the risen King, the resurrected Christ, Jesus himself. Will you see him? Will you recognize him? 
Will your eyes open and your heart burn within you as he retells your story in light of who he is? Will you wake up and embrace the resurrected king? Because in the end, I can tell you this, in the end, it will be worth it. And even though it may not make sense now, it will one day make sense. Look to Jesus. Will you pray with me? Our Father, we're so grateful for your Son, your only beloved Son, perfect and holy, the perfect spotless Lamb of God who you gave up to be sacrificed for our sins, to cover our sins, to, to rescue us from death and to give us eternal life. And God, we're grateful that you not only sent Jesus to the cross, but that you also brought him back to life on the third day. We celebrate that today. Jesus, we celebrate you as our risen and ascended Lord and King, the resurrected Christ. And Father, if we've never done it before, would you take us on a journey this day, even this week, to looking back at our lives, to allow you to point out the places where you were there, where you were walking alongside, alongside us, holding us, maybe carrying us, maybe wiping away our tears, maybe praying and interceding for us as we went. God, would you help us to see how you are making our broken stories into something beautiful? And Father, as we look to your son Jesus today, would we trust him for our salvation and for our eternal life? Pray this in your name, amen.